So one, um, I have found out in the last um, year um, that I have been, um, that my colleagues have suffered me as director of the Latin American Center, that one of the pleasures of doing this job is actually uh, to introduce people. Um, and particularly when you have the opportunity to introduce um, someone that is both a great academic, uh, a great policymaker, uh, and also very close um, to the Latin American Center. So it's um, like the full um, of, of everything. Uh, and this is very much the case. So um, Professor Jose Antonio Campo, now at Columbia, um, I think is one of the unique personalities, both in Latin America, but actually in the world, that has made very significant contributions, both on how we think about development, on how we think about Latin America, but uh, has also been, as a policymaker, able to implement it. Um, most of you will know he was Minister of Finance in Colombia, Minister of Agriculture previously also in Colombia. Um, more importantly for me at least, um, the one, the key job of all of those, Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission of Latin America, uh, given how important it is, he took um, CEPAL at a very, um, I would say at a relatively difficult moment and really reinvented um, the discourse both intellectually and in terms of practice. Um, and then of course was Under Secretary General of the Economic and Social Affairs and candidate for the World Bank presidency, which um, would have been um, really, very really great, but merit is not always the way to decide these types of posts. Um, for us, uh, even more significantly, uh, Jose Antonio has been a close uh, friend, collaborator of the Latin American Center from um, the time where Rosemary Thorpe um, created a project on the hi economic history of Latin America, and you work very close together uh, with it, and uh, we have been fortunate to uh, have him many times since. Um, more significantly for a conference, there's very few people that have thought uh, about the issue of um, the different dimensions that we want to highlight on informality today, from um, the link to social policy and to how you construct contributory and non-contributory programs, to the links to the economic structure, and as Enrique Garcia was saying, the limits uh, of the economic structure on promoting um, better jobs, but also on the political dimension with all the work that Jose Antonio has done on democracy and in implications on policy. Um, so welcome, Jose Antonio. Um, the floor is all yours. Um, you have around 45 minutes. We are short of time. So if you <laughs> can take 43, that would be amazing. Um, Let me start by, by thanking uh, both CAF and the Latin American Center for, uh, for this invitation to be today. Um, uh, it is a great pleasure, uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, first of all, because it is, um, uh, it is uh, uh, as, as Diego already pointed out, uh, for this event, the, um, the uh, a farewell to to Enrique Garcia. Uh, Enrique Garcia, uh, for many of us, uh, has been the, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 one of the greatest uh, multilateral bankers uh, uh, in recent decades. I, I say this all around the world. Uh, uh, because, uh, I mean, he transformed uh, CAF from uh, a small Andean institution into the leading uh, multilateral development bank for Latin America and increasingly also the Caribbean now. So, so it's, a, it's a great achievement. Uh, you know, so it has been a great to, first of all, to, uh, to work with him at you know, different times, uh, but also, uh, of course, to, to, you know, to sh you know, share his uh, friendship uh, through uh, many, many years. Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, to Diego, uh, it's a, you know, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, at, the, at San Antonio's College and uh, at the Latin American Center. I have had the opportunity to be twice here. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, you know, at the invitation of Malcolm Dees uh, many, many years ago. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, to work with this project with Rosemary Thorpe uh, on the economic history of Latin America, which uh, has been one of the greatest uh, things I, I've done. So it has uh, uh, always been that, that and I, I start by apologizing because of, uh, I actually misspelled center here. Uh, <laughs> this is the US influence, it's bad in many ways, but this is particular, the, the <laughs> uh, 
Uh, the, this is the American spelling, not the British spelling of center. <laughs> and so uh, I, I should be doubly trained in that regard because uh, in the United Nations, we use uh, a British spelling. <laughs> so I should apologize twice for that. Uh, anyway, um, l let me say also that uh, uh, I, I always understood, I, I didn't even ask, uh, you know, we're talking about informality in the labor market sense of the term. Uh, I, I'm not referring to the other concept of informality that we use in Latin America, which is people that, let's say, that do their uh, uh, economic activities outside the law. Uh, you know, there's, a, I guess, an intersection between the two, but uh, I'm going to refer to labor market informality. Uh, I didn't even ask whether that was the topic, but I, uh, I understood it to be that one. Anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, the, um, so what I'm going to, uh, uh, to argue here uh, is that you know, there has been a, a huge uh, advance uh, in the social area uh, in Latin America in the last, uh, depending on what data you analyze in the last 25 years or in the last decade, uh, but particularly in the last decade, or, or strictly speaking, the decade, let's say, between 2003, 2004, and 2013, uh, which, uh, I to which I would refer to as the social decade, because uh, the, the improvements in so many indicators uh, were, were impressive by Latin America's history that I think uh, deserve that, that name. Uh, by the way, I do not agree with the concept that has been put, put up by the, <coughs> by the president of the Inter-American Development Bank, or referring to that as the as the economic decade too, because I don't think it was a great achievement in uh, the first part prior to what I call the North Atlantic crisis, not the global financial crisis, because uh, it was not global, it was North Atlantic of 2008, 2009. Uh, uh, prior to that, we did have uh, a, a spectacular period in economic terms, uh, but not the second part, uh, the 2000, let's say, a 2013 was not a spectacular in terms of economic growth in Latin America. So it's, that's why the, I think the, it's, it's correct to talk about the social decade, but it's not about an economic decade. So, so le, let, me, let me start with the first look, and you know, I will start with the uh, non uh, issues that are not totally related to informality, then land into the issues of informality and, and come to, to some policy conclusions uh, related to that. So, let me start by, by saying the, uh, the, uh, uh, that you know, the advances uh, uh, you know, uh, start with a with significant improvement in social spending uh, that is now, that starts in the early 1990s, as we will see, uh, which has been impressive, uh, in, uh, actually impressive in worldwide standards, not only in Latin American standards. Uh, the, the major implication of, of that uh, was an improvement in many uh, in indicators, but particularly I will focus on the human development indicators of using the UNDP data, uh, and, uh, and notably in education. The coverage of education uh, in Latin America was quite impressive in the last 25 years, so much so that the uh, population uh, with limited education has actually fallen in absolute terms uh, in the region. In terms of labor markets, uh, and uh, as uh, I will argue, uh, because of the uh, of, of labor markets uh, in poverty and inequality, uh, uh, the, uh, we have two very distinct periods. The uh, first period, uh, let's say from 1990 to, to 2002, 2003, uh, which is a period of deterioration in labor market indicators. Uh, for that reason, uh, uh, worsening uh, income distribution and very limited advance in poverty. So much that in, in the case of poverty, Latin America experienced not the lost decade, but the lost quarter century. Uh, from 1980, uh, 1980 to 2002, 2003, you know, the poverty levels remain more, uh, you know, uh, without any, you know, decreasing trend. And then the second period, which is the, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, since 2003, we have a, a significant improvement, uh, which was more marked in the first part, 2003, 2007, uh, basically because that was a period of economic boom. Uh, in the second half, it continued, but you know, at, at a lower speed. Uh, so it, it is only in the last period, uh, in the last decade, that we have had a, a significant improvements. Uh, and for that reason, uh, as I wrote in the paper some time ago, uh, up to 2003, you can talk about 
uh, advances in human development, uh, but uh, with precarious employment and, and economic insecurity. Uh, uh, but in the second period, you can actually talk about the social decade. Uh, and the, and the, the key to, to that uh, ha, uh, was uh, the improvements in the labor market indicators, uh, with some exceptions, including informality, as we will see, uh, uh, which um, uh, improved, uh, it, it was the key to, uh, to the significant imp improvements in, uh, in poverty and, and inequality. And therefore, the, the, uh, and, and I underline this in yellow here, uh, you know, what I think has been characteristic uh, of the, what we have seen in Latin America over the last quarter century is a significant asym as uh, asymmetry between what we have been achieving in the social area and the foreign human development uh, than uh, what we have seen uh, in, in terms of labor markets. So the inadequate, uh, limited capacity uh, to generate quality employment has been the, uh, the basic problem uh, that we have faced. This is a, a symmetry that I think is at the, at the center uh, of the tensions that, that I will try to show uh, in the next week. So, uh, so let me start with social policy. Social policy then uh, uh, starts to, to be uh, 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 positive in the early 1990s. Uh, in which we see a, a broad-based increase in social spending throughout the region. Uh, I, I, I think this uh, can be considered a democratic dividend uh, because it did uh, start with the return to democracy. It has been generalized. Uh, it has taken place no, uh, in right-wing governments and left-wing governments as I, uh, in, both, in both cases. So it's, not, so it's, it's more a democratic uh, a, a, a event, uh, in my view. Uh, there are, of course, significant uh, uh, problems that remain. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, they, they relate to quality issues. Uh, uh, they relate to the uh, limited uh, <coughs> coverage of social protection, although, as uh, we will see, there has been a, a, an improvement also in that area, and the redis limited redistributive effect of fiscal policy, essentially because the amount of resources that are put uh, into, uh, into this is, uh, is, a, is a limited one in most countries. But a significant improvement is uh, that that we observe in human development. Uh, and I will actually focus uh, on the social indicators of human development. So I take the human development indicator of UNDP, but only analyze the, uh, the social uh, indicator that is education and health. So this is the story, let's say, of the uh, uh, yeah, uh, of social spending as a proportion of GDP. You see the contraction during the 1980s, uh, and then the very impressive expansion. There are two different series from CEPAL, both of them, uh, so, but they do not exactly coincide, but the, the trends are quite clear. So uh, it's, you know, it shrank during the 1980s, and then it has a huge expansion, which actually starts in the early 1990s, and with a little reversal during the uh, crisis of the early 20th, uh, 21st century, it has, uh, it has continued. Um, uh, uh, you observe it in all areas of spending, so education, uh, health, social protection, and housing. In every area, you had uh, a significant improvement. This is the uh, uh, average for Latin America. Uh, and it ha happened in every country. So the, the dark blue indicates the increase in the spending relative to 1990. Uh, so, uh, and, and of, but uh, uh, it, it, I mean, the only Limited exception is Panama, uh, also Chile, but in the case of Chile, the, the, I think part of the, uh, the issue in the data is that there's lots of uh, 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 activity that take place now outside the public sector in health and social security uh, that you know, it's not captured, let's say, as, as it is in, uh, in other countries. In the rest of the country, you have a, a significant improvement, but it's still you know, huge differences in the amount of Investment. So you have uh, countries with very limited social spending, Dominican Republic and Guatemala, uh, Ecuador, Panama, etc., Peru. Uh, and then you have, of course, the, the champions, uh, Cuba, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, Costa Rica. By the way, uh, some of these are all champions. You know, you do history, they, they go back to uh, many decades uh, prior to this. Now, uh, the result was, uh, was this uh, broad-based uh, Improvement in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in human development. So these are the human development indicators of uh, UNDP, health, education, income, the total. Uh, but when you see, that the, when you see the social, and uh, particularly uh, the education, 
uh, the improvement is, uh, is, uh, is remarkable. Uh, you know, in, uh, in health, there is also an improvement, but not as marked as in education. This is basically reflects uh, increased coverage uh, of the education system that has taken place uh, everywhere. So, the, uh, uh, so when, uh, in income, you can see that there is almost no improvement that is in relative terms, uh, except for you know, a shorter period, the, uh, the human development indicator for income is more or less uh, the same that we have back in 1990, uh, actually back in 1980, which is the beginning of this graph. Uh, and actually, when you play with these numbers, and, and this is a, a very um, a personal uh, a, a attempt to look at it, uh, I get this uh, interesting uh, graph, uh, which shows where the Latin American are, uh, countries are uh, relative to the human development indicator in just education and health, not income, in which we are bad, <laughs> uh, adjusted for inequality. So these are the uh, UNDP inequality adjusted human development indicators for education and health. And there you can see that, uh, and this is the international pattern. So you can see that actually most Latin American countries are on top of the international pattern now uh, in terms of, uh, of those indicators. Uh, you, know, they, they are, uh, you can say the only real exception in, in this graph is the Dominican Republic. You know, partly Brazil, but Brazil has you know, made you know, major improvements because it was far up, uh, below this uh, in the past. But the rest of countries are essentially on top. And you see here the, 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 the champions, uh, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, and Costa Rica. I don't have uh, Cuba here, uh, but Cuba will also show up uh, in, in this graph. And in, in a broader historical trend, uh, uh, you see the, uh, the, the stories also uh, quite impressive. This is the, from the book I did with uh, Luis Bertolo, The Economic History of Latin America. Uh, this is the relative uh, uh, education and health human development indicators in a long-term perspective, which starts in the late 19th century. Uh, and you can see that, uh, you know, the, uh, particularly in the education in particular, there has been some catching up vis-a-vis -vis the developed countries, which is the reference uh, in this graph. Uh, what is the, uh, 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 what are the uh, uh, gaps? I mean, uh, I, I'll, I'll talk about some of the of them uh, in my following uh, in, in the next few minutes. But uh, let me say that th this is the uh, uh, one, which is the limited uh, uh, fiscal redistribution. Uh, this is the OECD data on Latin America versus OECD, uh, which shows that in, uh, you know, the improvement in OECD uh, when you take into account taxes and, and transfers uh, versus what we achieve in Latin America, which is quite limited. And the reason for that is basically that we spend too little. So the, this, the, this is a graph taken from, I mean, or, or done with the data from, uh, from the project that Nora Lustig uh, uh, coordinates at Tulane University with the American Dialogue, uh, in which uh, we graph here the, uh, uh, the social spending as a proportion of GDP versus the redistributive impact that they estimate uh, for social spending. And you see clearly that if you want to redistribute more, you have to spend more, period. That's the Latin American story. So, so Argentina, Costa Rica, Brazil, Uruguay uh, do quite a bit of redistribution because they have more social spending. Uh, you know, Guatemala, El Salvador, Peru, Paraguay, uh, in, in their studies come very, with very little distribution because they spend too little. So if you want to spend, you want to redistribute and improve income distribution in Latin America, you have to spend. And for that, you have to raise taxes and, and social security contributions, as I will argue. There is, no, uh, there is no shortcut uh, to improving uh, uh, inequality uh, than that. So in, um, in, in poverty and income distribution, uh, 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 again, my, the essential story uh, is that the, um, uh, again, that the, the improvement uh, came with a lack. There was actually a deterioration in the labor market indicators in the 1990s, despite the renewal of economic growth. Uh, and this it may be associated to several factors, but there are uh, two that are clearly important. The first one is the, ma the market reforms, uh, and, the, and the second one is the uh, uh, deindustrialization that started to take place very fast in South America. 
uh, uh, because the north of the region actually did better than the south of the region uh, in terms of the labor market uh, indicators. There are other things, you know, including the state transfer, the conditional cash transfers, et cetera, but they have a weaker effect. So the, uh, I think the literature has uh, definitely come into the view that it was the labor market conditions, uh, the, including the distribution of labor incomes, that was the, behind the uh, this significant improvement in poverty and income distribution uh, in the, in, during the decade. There is also, uh, by the way, a demographic factor, which is very little uh, emphasized. Uh, uh, I, I, I always uh, point out in, in, in my presentations, and, and at least, uh, I mean, one thing that, um, that I get now is a footnote from Nora Lustig, you know, which is a significant advance for me. Uh, because it, it, which is the demographic effect. It's the demographic effect, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a graph here, which is the fact that, uh, that the growth of the labor force in Latin America is now much slower than 15 to 20 years ago. And I think that that's a lasting effect, uh, and I think the, a very important one going forward. Uh, in the short term, uh, uh, run in positive terms, in the long run, of course, in uh, more, uh, with more question mark because we don't have good pension systems in, in, in the region. Anyway, the unresolved issues is that we still have high wealth concentration. Uh, this is particularly uh, when, or the 1%, uh, 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 the share of the richest 1% in income uh, is terribly high. Uh, but the, uh, there are some gender dimensions, uh, very limited intergenerational mobility, which is something that comes out very clear in the studies. Uh, and, uh, uh, and very important, uh, which is the, I think the topic here, uh, which is the large differences in productivity uh, among sectors and agents, uh, which is some, uh, a subject that uh, has been analyzed by several people in, uh, in recent years, uh, which I think is a, is a very, very important uh, issue. Uh, in, uh, in the jargon of CEPAL, this is uh, what is called structural heterogeneity. Uh, as one of the you know, in, inbuilt features of the, of the Latin American economic uh, model. Very fast, this is the story of poverty using CEPAL data. Uh, you can see that uh, my lost quarter century in, 19, in 2002, uh, poverty levels were still higher than in 1980. Uh, but then there's a very impressive improvement uh, between then and 2013, which has already stopped. Uh, actually, we are in a reversal uh, now. Uh, the, uh, uh, let me say that, the, you know, since I write history, the only comparable period of the poverty reduction in the history of Latin America was the 1970s. So this and the 1970s are the two periods where there's a huge uh, reduction in poverty levels. Uh, that's it, okay? So this is not a, it's a very unique event. And it's a, 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 a even more unique because it coincided with improving the income distribution, which is very, uh, th this is a typical at the global level. We are about the only region of the world where income distribution has improved over the last, you know, since the early part of the 21st century. Uh, so this is a, it's a quite, uh, this is the uh, uh, data, data from, uh, basically from settlers, from the, uh, uh, you know, but also the older numbers that come from a, a paper by Gasparini and Lustig, which is also based on, on settler's data. And the improvement has been generalized. I will not get into, into this, uh, in not always in relation to 2000, to, uh, let's say the total in red. There are a few countries where the uh, income distribution is still worse according to this data than it was uh, uh, in, in 1993. Uh, uh, Colombia, actually Costa Rica is the most troublesome case of all. In Latin America, it used to be the, one of the champions of low inequality. It no longer uh, is, let's say, it has moved. Uh, but there are other, you know, Colombia here is also one case, Honduras, and, and you see Uruguay and Venezuela, although Uruguay has lots of question marks uh, uh, associated with the um, uh, huge difference, the data of settlers with that of CEPAL. Uh, but inequality continues to be high, uh, uh, so we should not forget about that. You know, uh, uh, again, the champions uh, uh, of usual champions, Argentina and Uruguay, Costa Rica, as you see, is no longer so. Uh, and then the, the worst distributions are in the, uh, in the same uh, country, Brazil, uh, although in Brazil it has improved, Colombia, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, 
uh, with the worst uh, income distribution of Latin America. This is a bit, uh, this is a bit of less of dispersion than in the past, but in a way, uh, we still have high levels in the quad. But let me uh, move into labor markets, which is uh, more the topic of this conference. Uh, again, emphasizing that uh, part of this is to, to show, first of all, the, the asymmetry between what we have achieved, achieved in, uh, uh, in, um, in terms of uh, social policy, uh, and second, the, you know, the very close connection between what we have achieved in poverty and income distribution and what has happened in labor markets. And what has not happened in labor markets, uh, which is part of the problem. So, in labor market conditions, uh, you can say that the, uh, the market reforms uh, had uh, an initially adverse effect on employment. Uh, this is a, a, this was a more mark in, the, in South America than in Mexico and Central America, which in my view essentially has to do with the effects on industrialization. Latin America, start, uh, South America started to de-industrialize de very fast. Um, uh, uh, where Mexico and Central America have more or less kept, uh, in some cases actually have improved their, their share of manufacturing uh, in GDP. Um, the, the labor market reforms, there uh, uh, have been lots of research on this. Uh, uh, I think the, uh, what you can say that the effect was rather marginal uh, in, uh, in labor markets, uh, but in, if anything, they probably uh, include uh, the share of precarious em uh, employment, that is em employment without, you know, uh, the advantages of uh, social protection. Uh, um, even uh, uh, as Cepal started to, uh, to, do, to show uh, decades ago, a couple of decades ago, uh, with a significant uh, share uh, of people that don't have a labor contract, okay? Which is the worst part, uh, the worst form of uh, pre uh, precarious uh, em employment. Uh, uh, now, markets uh, uh, adjusted to this negative period in variable ways. Uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, you can say that uh, you can see more experiences of unemployment in South America uh, and more uh, experiences of informality in, uh, in the northern part uh, of the region. Uh, now, then uh, there are significant improvements in 2003, 2008 uh, uh, that uh, 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 that included the demographic effects of the demographic transition, uh, that is the reduction in the uh, uh, growth of the labor force, uh, together you can say with the uh, growing education of the labor force. Uh, so you have a, a slower pop, uh, labor force that is increasingly educated. Uh, so the uh, absolute uh, labor force with no education has actually shrank in the region. I think that's probably one of the most interesting advances uh, that the region has experienced, and it's a permanent one in my view, so that's, that's a, one of the achievements uh, 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 characterizing this period. Uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and this is because of the demographic transition, but also because of the, let's call it the maturing of the uh, 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 women's uh, market uh, participation, labor market participation. So the, you know, the Labor market uh, uh, participation of women started to increase very fast in the 1970s, and, uh, but it has tended to, uh, to grow at very slow rates uh, in recent decades. So the, both the demographic effect and the effect of the maturing of the uh, labor uh, market participation of women has implied that the labor force uh, has been increasing uh, 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 at a very uh, slow rate. <laughs> Now, what you can see that the deterioration of the first period was not totally reversed uh, in the second period. Uh, and, and this is uh, notably the case of informality. So although in many indicators we are better than we were in 1990, in labor markets uh, this is not true of informality. So informality is actually one of the major problems and, uh, 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 that, uh, that we will see in the graphs. So this is the story, uh, 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 the average uh, uh, unemployment in red and employment uh, rates. Employment, I call here the uh, the uh, the, uh, um, the share of the um, uh, of the labor force that is employed. So it includes, uh, let's say, the age group, the relevant age group, multiplied by the participation rate, uh, and uh, that's what it gives me the employment rate. What you can see here is unemployment is very clear. You know, it increased uh, in the 1980s, even during the growth period. It's not only the crisis. 
Uh, and then, uh, and then it, it shrank. Now it is increasing again. And this year, uh, we may be reaching actually 8% because of the deterioration of Brazil. Uh, uh, now, the uh, employment also, you see, it shrank uh, from, let's say, 54% of the labor force to, uh, excuse me, this is the share of the uh, 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 people in, in that population group, let's say. 50% of the people between 16 and uh, 65 were employed. Uh, then it shrank to 52, but it increased by you know, more or less four percentage points uh, uh, during this uh, you know, social decade. Uh, again, it's starting to decrease uh, with the crisis. But you know, during that period, we had an increase. Uh, in these two cases, but particularly in the case of employment, uh, the conditions are very uh, much better than they were, uh, 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 in, let's say, in, in 1990. Uh, in unemployment, uh, uh, it's more, you know, uh, with current deterioration, we're actually more or less at the same level. Uh, but what matters is uh, in the informality that, as we will see, is important. And this is uh, actually, uh, 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 this is my demographic point, uh, uh, together with the uh, uh, women's labor market participation, which is the annual rate of growth of the labor force. So you see the, uh, you know, from the second half of the 1970s, uh, to the, uh, to the end of this uh, 20th century, we have labor market growth rates of about three, let's say three and a half percent per year, uh, which is a huge, uh, very fast rate of growth. So you, you, still, you have to ha uh, grow GDP at least, or you know, four or five percent, simply to absorb the growth of the labor force. Uh, but look at this uh, you know, major uh, uh, reduction uh, and actually, most of the reduction to, uh, took uh, uh, place in the early 21st uh, century. So this is the period 2003, 2008, this is 2008, 2002, and this is the projected uh, growth uh, by the population division of CEPAL uh, for the next, uh, you know, to, to 20. So you can see that, you know, today, let's say, uh, the growth of the labor force is something between one and a half and two percent. So it's, uh, the demand on growth and, and the possibilities actually of Improving productivity significantly, you have rates of growth of even four or five percent. It's quite high relative to the patterns that we observe from the 1970s to the late 20th century. In this regard, this is my demographic point. This is a very important. This is the point that I have been trying to convince Nora Lustiga is important, but so I, she has not quite captured it yet. Okay. Now, informality is a different story. Um, uh, informality is actually, they say, the, uh, the black spot uh, in, in this picture. Um, so uh, in a paper done uh, by Victor Tuckman a, a few years ago, uh, this, is, uh, this is where his estimates actually that, uh, that the informal economy, his definition, had actually increased uh, still by 1980, was larger than in 1990. Uh, said that the, the, the usual definition of the informal sector, and this is the, uh, the definition, uh, uh, I, I guess the, today we have essentially three definitions uh, that uh, are used in, in the literature. Um, uh, one that I'm not going to use, which is the uh, people without access to social security. I think that's, a, that's not a, quite an indicator of the informal employment, um, uh, although it's a feature of informality. Um, uh, and, and the others are uh, the, the classical definition from ILO, uh, which is the one Tokman uses, and, uh, and the other institution that continues using is CEPAL, but it does, CEPAL doesn't call it informality, but uh, low, quality, low, low, low productivity employment. <laughs> that's the exact term that, they, that CEPAL uses, okay? Uh, and the other, which is the definition of ILO uses today for the world, which is vulnerable employment, uh, which is a, a more restricted definition. Uh, a, the difference between the two of them is that in uh, the traditional definition of ILO that CEPAL continues to use, uh, we, you include uh, you know, wage labor in a sm very small enterprises, in micro enterprises, which depending on the countries, generally is five workers or less in the firm. Okay? Uh, whereas uh, uh, ILO does not include that. So ILO only includes uh, uh, self-employed and um, or uh, and um, uh, and domestic workers, okay, uh, in, the, in in his definition of vulnerable employment. By the way, this is a very peculiar story because uh, somehow the old concept of ILO only uh, was captured by Latin America. In the rest of the world, they don't use that concept. Uh, 
so it's a very historical accident, let's say, but we continue using that concept again. So this is the broad definition. But on top of that, uh, uh, Tuckman includes uh, uh, what he calls precarious formal workers. Now, precarious formal workers are essentially workers in the formal sector that do not have a labor contract, a written labor contract. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and you can see that, the, the, uh, uh, although it's small in, in relative to the other, the normal informal sector, is still uh, is the major cause of why in 2008 uh, it continued to be higher than in 1990. Now, this is the broader definition of informality, which uh, according, using uh, 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 data from CEPAL. Uh, and, and here you can see that there was a deterioration in the 1990s, like in all other mar labor market indicators, something be between 40 and, uh, and 48%. And then there was a decline, but the decline was partial. So that by uh, 2014 or 2013, uh, the levels were higher than in 1990, okay? Uh, and, uh, particularly for the two uh, important categories, which is the low-skilled self-employed uh, and the uh, 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 micro-enterprise uh, workers. You know, the other two more or less were in the same level, you know, the domestic employment, and this, which is the micro-entrepreneurs, uh, which are included also in the definition of informality in, in, according to this. Um, now, uh, there are still significant uh, differences in the size of the informal economy and, inf and, inf and informality. So this is, uh, again, Tuckman's data for 2008. I'll show in a few minutes that this is uh, a, a, the, the blue part, which is the informal sector in the traditional definition, uh, is, uh, is very much related to the level of development of countries. So the main determinant is level of development. Uh, uh, not uh, other factors, which I will criticize at the end of my presentation. Um, uh, uh, but also, the, uh, I think precarious labor uh, is, a, is an equally problematic effect. And in some cases, it's remarkably high, not only in Argentina, but also in Mexico. You know, Argentina has a huge uh, share of that type of employment. Uh, and then you have Honduras, etc., Paraguay on top, and Nicaragua. But uh, so uh, the problem is in both sides. But I, I, this one is not really the uh, precarious labor is not quite related to the level of development as the other parties, uh, which is the one I will focus on. But uh, so the, this reflects the lack of control, uh, legal control, uh, on enterprises that you know you allow so many people to to go employed as wage laborers with 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 no labor contract, uh, which is. Uh, you know, one of the most troublesome features. Now, the um, the uh, the level of uh, unemployment uh, of informality, excuse me, uh, is essentially associated with the level of development of countries. Uh, so uh, here uh, you have. Uh, so first, I use vulnerable employment uh, versus uh, uh, gross national income per capita. This is uh, ILO data. Okay. I love data. So that you can see that uh, uh, you know, there is a, a quite clear negative relation. Uh, so as you increase income, the share of informality falls. OK? Um, uh, quite clear. Uh, now, there are exceptions uh, on the both the positive and negative side. I mean, for example, this is a positive exception, Costa Rica, uh, because at this level of income, per capita income, it has much lower level of uh, a, a vulnerable employment. Argentina is again a negative. Uh, and here you have Colombia and Ecuador, for example, also as being negative cases. Uh, El Salvador uh, uh, and Nicaragua, and Honduras, actually, some Central American countries actually being uh, positive cases uh, uh, of that. And this is the CEPAL, the old ILO definition. Uh, so, uh, so this is CEPAL data. The same one, except that we have low productivity workers, so the broader definition of informality. Uh, and this is per capita GDP. And you, you get the same <laughs> negative uh, relation, so uh, you want to have a lower, uh, a lower informality. Uh, that is done with a higher <coughs> per capita income. Again, there are some exceptions. Uh, Mexico c comes out here as a country with too much informality. Uh, uh, Venezuela also, uh, and then Colombia, uh, Peru, and Ecuador 
a, a bit less. But, you know, the positive cases, uh, again, uh, here Costa Rica again, Brazil actually comes out also positively uh, in this graph. Um, actually, I think Mexico also, yeah. Yeah, Mexico was also a negative one here. Mexico is on top of here. Uh, Mexico and Venezuela here, okay? So Mexico, Venezuela, Argentina, for example, are the higher income per capita income countries are, you know, bad cases. Costa Rica being a, a good one. Uh, Colombia and Ecuador as uh, negative cases. Uh, okay. Now, the, the, the other dimension uh, that is interesting is that, uh, and this is much better known, is the relation with, uh, with, uh, between the social security coverage and informality. Uh, and uh, in which, it, you know, according to uh, uh, any category um, uh, uh, used, uh, first of all, the worst cases are workers without a contract in all dimensions, but uh, when you have contracts, uh, uh, the formal and informal uh, have a huge difference. So, uh, so the informality uh, does generate uh, lower access to social security. Uh, but in my view, this is not a good reason to define informality as lack of social security. I mean, social, lack of social security has an effect on formality uh, in, in, uh, in labor market. However, the improvements in this uh, regard uh, are quite, quite important. And, and based on, a, a, on a, uh, a paper I did for the ILO uh, this year with uh, uh, Natalie Gomez, uh, I, uh, I, we estimated uh, indices um, uh, of, uh, of social protection uh, with you know, three indicators of, uh, basically indicators of how universal the systems, the access is, how uh, the um, uh, 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 in, in unequal uh, it is, uh, and third, how much money uh, is spent on the system. We indic uh, estimated indicators of, uh, uh, of, uh, of informality, let's say, uh, excuse me, of, social, of the level of social protection between zero and one, let's say. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we, we came to this uh, division between comprehensive social protection systems, intermediate and limited. You know, the, the comprehensives are the, the the usual suspects, Uruguay, Chile, Costa Rica, Argentina, and Brazil. Then you have the intermediate cases led by Venezuela and Colombia, and then the uh, uh, low cases, which are essentially the Central American countries and Paraguay and Bolivia. Uh, but you, you can see also the, the improvement that took place uh, between 2002 and 2012, let's say, in, uh, in, in many, many countries in the region. Uh, 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 you know, the most important improvements uh, were actually uh, Argentina among the high, uh, Colombia and Peru in the intermediate group, uh, uh, actually Dominican Republic too, uh, and Bolivia uh, here among the, uh, the, the uh, countries with uh, limited social security. But what is uh, equally interesting is not only the improvement, but the fact that we found uh, analyzing what happened with poverty during this period uh, that uh, it was more associated to these improvements uh, than with uh, growth. So this is the association with growth. So this is the same period, uh, the, uh, how poverty, uh, the, the reduction in poverty levels versus growth. And you can see, yes, there was a negative relation. So the more uh, countries grew, the more uh, income, uh, uh, the more uh, uh, poverty uh, fell. But this is more impressive, actually. Uh, so the improvements in social protection uh, uh, were more important uh, in terms of poverty reduction uh, than growth itself, uh, indicating, therefore, that the, you know, the social uh, system is, import is much more important uh, or is equally important for poverty reduction and not only for uh, growth. Okay, so let me finish with, uh, with some uh, uh, policy uh, remarks. Um, uh, so I, I will start by uh, underscoring the first point, uh, the, the one that I made in the beginning, uh, that the, the reduction in the asymmetry between the achievements in social policy uh, and uh, uh, the much more limited uh, uh, advances in, um, uh, in labor markets is the crucial issue uh, in, in, in this area. Um, and this is, of course, more complex now that we are in a slowdown, uh, notably in South America. So it's, a, it's a going to be a huge uh, uh, challenge. Uh, and it has a, a social inclusion and economic inclusion dimensions. 
the social inclusion dimensions uh, is, uh, is how much you, uh, we continue to advance uh, in, uh, in, in the coverage of social policies. And uh, as the last graph showed, uh, that is important for poverty reduction, uh, uh, not only uh, in, in income terms, not only uh, for uh, uh, social advance. Uh, and the second is economic inclusion, which is the area which we have advanced the less, uh, advanced less than in social inclusion, uh, and therefore where the uh, challenges are immense. And a crucial debate is, uh, uh, which has been around uh, Latin America in the last uh, five years or so, uh, which is uh, the, the debate of whether uh, informality is, uh, is caused by the way social policies are financed, particularly by, by payroll taxes, the role of payroll taxes. And, uh, and I'm going to argue the opposite to, to the views of uh, several that, you know, the, the road to reducing informality is just to reduce payroll taxes. I think that's a wrong way to go. Uh, uh, for the reasons I, I will argue. Um, uh, so, uh, in a, so first we need uh, to, uh, to maintain the pace of social inclusion. Uh, 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 this, again, the, uh, the most important thing has been the uh, universal policies, uh, education and health in particular, uh, conditional cash transfer and other targeted policies have also contributed, but I think the literature now comes decisively in the, uh, to the view. Uh, that it, it was less important, uh, and I would say by far the most important thing that happened in social policy in Latin America were the advances in education. Uh, and I think consolidating those advances is, in my view, the, uh, the most important. Then you need the, uh, the, uh, the how to guarantee universal access, uh, particularly to social protection, which is still uh, an area where uh, 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 coverage is, is, is limited. Then you have different instruments that uh, several countries are trying. The solidarity pillars is a good idea. Let's say the monotax system uh, invented by Uruguay, uh, you know, trying to see how to simplify uh, tax collection of very small enterprises is also a very good idea. Uh, anyway, those are some of the initiatives, and there are you know, several other initiatives trying to incorporate, the, let's say, the informal workers into social protection systems, uh, which is, I think, some of the gap, major gap uh, we still see in, in Latin America. The, then, of course, the, the quality of services and the amount of spending, because uh, we saw that the, the, if you want to redistribute more, you have to spend more, period. Uh, and, and in order to spend more, you have to have more income uh, for the government. Uh, so you know, how you increase the revenues for the government is also uh, a, you know, an important issue. But the, uh, the economic inclusion is a major challenge. Uh, uh, and I would say, the, uh, in this regard, uh, let me start by saying that the major challenge today uh, is, of course, uh, uh, economic growth. Renewing uh, rapid economic growth because informality is essentially determined by level of development. So you want to reduce informality in the long term, the way you ahead is basically grow again and, and grow uh, as dynamically as you can. I think that seems to be one. And, and, and for that, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, I think echoing uh, what uh, Enrique Garcia said in the introduction, uh, I think the uh, production sector policies, uh, which is the way I prefer, the term I prefer, not industrial policies. Uh, uh, so production sector policy, because they can go for any sector, uh, including manufacturing, but agriculture, services, because services are now an you know, interesting opportunity in many countries, uh, including service exports. Uh, so that you know you can go uh, in you know into any sector, but what I think is important is the knowledge contents uh, of the activity that you want to promote, because that's the way to grow fast. Uh, uh, I mean, the big I think the big lesson uh, from the you know comparing Latin America with East Asia uh, is that East Asia bet uh, on the uh, you know on the knowledge intensive sectors and they grew much faster than Latin America. Uh, manufacturing, in particular, in their case. Uh, but we also have opportunities in, uh, in services. In, uh, and, and actually, the, interestingly, the, the natural resource sector is a sector in which there have been lots of innovations in technological terms, including even more than in manufacturing or, or services in Latin America. Okay? So uh, that is a, a, you know, one element. But the other element, the one that is relevant more, you know, uh, or at least equally relevant for this forum is what do you do uh, with these uh, small producers? 
and particularly how you reduce this huge productivity gap uh, in Latin America between large and small enterprises, which is much, much larger than the patents in Europe uh, and much more larger than patents in the United States, for example. I mean, according to lots of research that have been done. And then you, you, what you have, you need is comprehensive policies for small, small and very small enterprises. Uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, I, I mentioned here, uh, uh, um, the following elements. Credit, in which there has been some advance. Technology, little advance. Business education, there has been some advance. Uh, better commercial networks, zero advance. Uh, and uh, uh, very importantly, uh, supporting producers' associations. Uh, you know, small producers uh, will prosper uh, if they are associated. Uh, they, they do not uh, prosper as much if they are not associated. If they are individual, uh, small producers going into the markets, you know, they generally are under very weak conditions to, uh, to prosper. Uh, and uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I guess a, a, a particular emphasis, given the fact that I, this is something I have been working quite a bit in Colombia, uh, is that the, uh, uh, that the rural areas are particularly important. Uh, among other reasons, because informality is much larger uh, in rural areas. Uh, if you measure basically the uh, proportion of, let's say, of peasants uh, that are informal, you know, you, you may get in, con in many countries 90% or more of informality in rural areas. So what you do in rural areas is particularly important, and how, what do you do with this combination of policies for rural producers uh, it should be at the center of any agenda uh, in this regard. Now, m my last point is uh, the issue of financing of social policies, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, lots of discussion now uh, that, you know, the way to reduce informality is to reduce payroll taxes. Uh, we actually did in Colombia that in 2012. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not totally against the idea of reducing, uh, you know, payroll taxes. And actually, some European countries are actually doing this uh, also. Uh, but um, uh, what I want to underscore is several points. First of all, that the major determinant of uh, of informality is not payroll taxes. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, payroll taxes are very high in Europe. They don't seem to uh, be generating lots of informality. Uh, so, you know, developed countries actually do have a large amount of payroll taxes, and informal formality is not a major problem. So that's my first point. Second, uh, so the, the, according to the theoretical literature, this only happens if workers do not value the services that they receive. But the, the, if those services are valuable for producers, they don't, uh, for, for, uh, for the for the people, they don't mind paying the payroll taxes. I mean, the problem is they, if they have access and they have a quality service, uh, you know, they are not against. I mean, I think there's a lot of empirical evidence uh, of a microeconomic character that this is. Second, that, uh, that reducing payroll taxes sometimes does not reduce labor costs. Uh, for uh, an obvious reason is that some of the reduction in payroll taxes may be reflected in increased wages. Uh, so that the total effect uh, on, uh, on labor costs are much less uh, than, I mean, again, lots of evidence uh, that, that has taken place uh, uh, in some countries in different periods of time. Um, but even more than that, uh, I have just a, a question of principle. You know, since my model in, uh, has always been uh, trying to develop a, a welfare states like the European welfare states, uh, I cannot believe uh, uh, that it, it is possible without payroll taxes uh, to do that. Uh, uh, and second, that is not convenient, though it's not a reasonable way to go, uh, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because uh, you need the resources uh, to have a comprehensive social welfare system. Uh, you can not only do that uh, through you know, income and sales taxes, let's say, and BAT taxes. Uh, but second, because there must be a sense of belonging to those systems, that is an essential part of that. And belonging means that you have to uh, own it uh, in a significant sense you know, because you have contributed to it. So, so the sense of ownership of social welfare system has to be an essential part of building welfare states. Uh, and for that reason, you know, just eliminating welfare taxes and just doing everything through general taxation does not seem to me uh, to be uh, a, a good idea. Uh, and in any case, and this is the last point here, uh, without that money, you simply cannot develop that. I mean, uh, so the, uh, you, you can't think of a minimum uh, 
social protection and minimum levels of you know, social policy you know, financed by general taxes. But if you want to have a well-developed uh, health system, a well-developed um, pension system, a, a well-developed uh, you know, unemployment insurance, which uh, we almost don't have in Latin America, uh, all those systems cannot be developed just with general taxes. You need payroll taxes for that. Okay, thank you very much.